the Lord. <clears throat> I was just thinking, I was just in all these events and all these things going on. I was saying to myself, I'm going to move here. And then I found out we had to pay $500 for a, for a banquet. I thought, <laughs> I'll stay where I am. <clears throat> God is good to us, and he sure loves us, and we're blessed more than we deserve, that's for sure. I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus uh, this evening, and um, I bring you greetings from my family, and uh, Sister Becky, she sends all of her, uh, all the LaFontaine ladies uh, special greetings, and uh, from my church, and may um, just trust that uh, the Lord uh, we'll bless you all tonight. I'm not going to say anything about Ike because he was down in our area and didn't come to see me. And, uh, <clears throat> but it's an honor to be here. It's unexpected, but it's an honor to be here uh, tonight. If you don't mind, let's take your Bible. Let's go to Philippians chapter 1. And the song was just so fitting as we uh, want to look in this little text tonight. And I will tell you, I don't want to preamble very much at all. Thank you, musicians. I appreciate that and the atmosphere that's set. Uh, so I just want to jump right in, if that's okay. Brother Paul asked me to say a couple of words about Ukraine, and I, we may have a, uh, a little clip here to show you. But uh, let's begin in Philippians chapter 1, just while you're standing here. <clears throat> Verse 3, we'll start there. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always, in every prayer of mine, for you, all making requests with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He's able, isn't he? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to be able to come in your presence tonight and to be able to study your word, Lord, in peace and in the sanctity of this assembly, Lord, this evening, and to be able to uh, just, Lord, step out of the way and let you speak to our hearts. And Father, I know how you have dealt with me, and Lord, I just pray tonight that you would just take me as a, a vessel and a microphone, Lord, and just speak to the hearts of your people as you have spoken to me already. And I ask now, Lord, that you would just take complete control, forgive us of anything, Lord, that would hinder the moving of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, may when we leave here, we are able to say it's been good for us to be in your house with your people. Father, have your way among us now, we pray in Jesus' lovely name. Amen and amen. You may be seated this evening. <clears throat> there are lots of different things that are being said about Ukraine and Russia and so forth over the, over the airwaves. Some of it is true. Uh, we had one of the folks in our assembly who was just over there in Ukraine serving uh, there in a medical capacity. And uh, I will tell you that, uh, you know, we hear about uh, statements about the Russian forces retreating back from different places in Ukraine. The shock is, is that when the Ukrainians go back into those areas where the Russians had control, they generally find nothing there. There's hardly anything that they recognize in relation to their villages and their towns or homes. Sometimes they'll find foundations there, uh, but there's much of it that is absolutely totally unrecognizable. Many of them who left, left with only their possessions clothes on their back, maybe a bag of clothes, a couple of important documents, and, and left in a hurry because there was bombs in the air. And uh, when they come back, there's absolutely nothing there. So it's a really sad scenario. Um, and uh, there are many, many stories. But I thought, you know, sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words and the video clips are worth about 10,000. So I thought I'd just show you, if you can click to the next one. Now I don't have my, here it is. Now, I, I'm not sure we can play this, so let's just try. This, can we get sound? If you want, if we can play it again, if you got sound. Oh, let's go back. Work 
Дай мне быть числе и Боже, в том строю среди святых. They're just a very hearty people, and I will tell you that they really do appreciate every cent that's sent over. Uh, we still uh, continue to do that. We have to trickle funds over uh, just a little at a time, so we do not raise any flags over there. And uh, the money reaches those, those families there, and they, they, every now and then, and then when they can, they send back little video clips that uh, acknowledge the fact that they've received the funds. We have the names and addresses and phone numbers of everybody uh, who's received anything and from people over here. And uh, we have a wonderful team of brothers that, uh, that supernaturally, uh, when all the banking systems are down and all the other governmental work has come to a halt there, practically no medical facilities of any kind, and yet these team of three brothers in different parts of the world, they're able to get money into the uh, country there through cryptocurrency and through wiring and through different telephone apps that they use. Uh, it's just incredible how they do it. And uh, we're able to supply those brothers and those brothers supply those families over there. So there's about, uh, we believe, around 400, 450 individuals over there, about 130 families uh, that are still in that area. And uh, let me tell you, they, uh, they, they uh, really have to work hard to be able to get uh, basic necessities, medicines and uh, food and so forth. Uh, there was a brother over there, and I don't have a picture of it, but he was undergoing uh, chemotherapy for cancer that was all on the side of his face. It was a large tumor that had grown out, and he was taking therapy before the war started. Once the war started, the government took over all the hospitals uh, for the war effort, and so he couldn't take any more, uh, any more chemotherapy treatments at all and had no money to do that. And uh, as a result of that, uh, you know, he was left, uh, you know, to his own resources. And uh, the brothers over there, the sisters, when it was safe, they came out in the cover of night, got together, laid hands on that brother, and he's still with us. And we're very thankful for that. So uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's just a, a wonderful, uh, you know, uh, group of people to help and to work with. And uh, we're very thankful for all the uh, support and funds that have been given. All right, now I want to tell you this, that <clears throat> um, I had it on my heart to come, and Brother Paul and I were in contact, and uh, the Lord laid it on my heart to, to come, and uh, just uh, figured I would probably be here on a Wednesday night, and uh, had something that I was going to speak about, and then two nights ago, uh, around four o'clock in the morning, it was the night of the eclipse, whenever that was, um, the Lord, uh, I, I believe, stirred me, and I, was, uh, I woke up, and I was just go, uh, all of a sudden going through these scriptures and things that I had never ministered on before. I never, I never saw, I never thought about. And uh, I thought to myself, well, I'll wait until the eclipse starts, and then I'll get up and I'll look for those scriptures in the Bible. And uh, lo and behold, just as the eclipse started, I fell back to sleep, so I never got to see the eclipse. But I did remember the scriptures, and uh, so... I'm going to jump right in, and this is Wednesday night, so it's all right. If it's all right, take your Bible. We're going to look in some scriptures here, and uh, I realize, you know, that uh, there are many ways to uh, talk about the scripture and many ways to go at it. Uh, my way, some ways, sometimes is a little bit different. Uh, I think really what's important is that we may not all be preaching the same way, but what is important is that we're all preaching the same thing, and we have the same motive in preaching, and that is to prepare a people uh, for the change of our bodies so that, you know, we can make it into the kingdom. And that's what's important. The way we preach is really incidental. Uh, as long as God will take the vessel and use the message, that's what's important. Now, uh, the, flip, the book of Philippians here is a book that I've started to study and begin to minister on, but I haven't been able to get past the first 11 verses here. It's one of the positive books that Paul writes. It's written after his second journey, and uh, he really encourages the people uh, in their own personal experience, in their own personal walk with God. There's no mention here much of ministry. There's no mention of church order. No mention here of gifts and prophecy, hardly. Uh, he's really encouraging the people to become aware, not so much of the circumstances around you, but what God is doing within you. He wants them to understand that. He wants them to realize that the most important thing is not what's happening around, but what's happening within. And so he's, uh, he's dealing with the uh, you know, with the believers in this personal way, and he's encouraging them 
uh, in, in the way that only Paul can. Now, as we, as we look at this, and I, I wanted to read just a couple of scriptures for you, there's a really powerful word that's embedded in here, and that is the word perform, where Paul says that uh, being confident of this very thing, that he, has, he that began the good work will perform it. And that word perform, it's found in various places in the Bible, very specific, and it means to bring something to an end. It, it's not going to be stopped along the way, but it's going to be completed. It speaks of accomplishing something that is tied to the original purpose. So what's going to be done is going to be exactly what God had in mind. That's the idea. And not only is it, uh, is it pre-planned, but he's on hand to execute that. He's, he's on hand to make sure that that happens. And he's got a, just like we often say, he's got a will for you. He's got a plan and a purpose for you. You wouldn't be here. Don't tell me that God doesn't have a sense of humor. Hey, he left us here for the very end, right? All the great people and believers and saints that went before us. But God chose you and I to be here in the last of the last to bring it across the finish line. Don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. And yet he promises us, and this is what Paul is telling the believers there, that you need to be confident of this thing. You need to believe in this. And hang on to this because God's going to shake your world. And you need to hang on to this very fact that if God began it in you, he's going to execute it. He's going to see it all the way through. He's going to bring it to pass. He's going to, he's going to complete it. It's going to be done exactly the way that God uh, intended. And nothing's going to be left out. Nothing's going to be missing. Do you believe that? And, and that's, that's how he's encouraging the people. Now, how God does that is a really interesting story. Because how God deals with all of you is unique and interesting. It's specific to you. It's very personal. And what God is doing in your life and how God is dealing with you, uh, those things are, are really, really, uh, really, really important uh, in the accomplishment of God's purpose in your life. And so it, this word perform, if I could expand on it just a little bit more and say that uh, just like uh, in the Old Testament in Jeremiah chapter 29, you remember that story where Jeremiah tells the people, he says, you're going to be down there for 70 years. And in, in the appointed time, he says, I will perform my, my word uh, concerning you. I will perform my thought concerning you. And we find the same Hebrew word, uh, basically. And, and it literally means this, that the word can lay dormant for a long time. I've spoken it, but it doesn't necessarily come to pass exactly when I speak it. But when the time comes, I'm going to breathe into it. And when I breathe into it, man, it's going to happen. There's going to be something go on during that time. And, and you, need, you need to be ready during that time. That's 70 years, and I'm giving you the warning in advance. Because when God sets this word on fire and God breathes into it, you better be ready to go because it's going to happen. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it to life in the same way that Martin Lu or sorry, in the same way that Malachi 4 laid there for hundreds and thousands of years. And uh, nothing, nothing can make that happen until God's time. But when God's time comes, man, we're all, we're all very sure of what Malachi 4 means, aren't we? There are other people in other ages who believe that that might have applied to them, like Martin Luther. Martin Luther, I read in a book where he said, I believe that may be a description of my ministry, to turn the hearts of the children back to the faith of the fathers. Well, that made sense to a Catholic, especially if you were living in the season of the Reformation. But it was not for Martin Luther. He could know it, but he could not make it live. But when God made it live in the 1900s, let me tell you, it leaves no doubt as to what that verse actually means. God brings it to pass. God executed it. God completed it. How many believe that God completed what he wanted to complete in Brother Bram's ministry? It's not, and listen, we're not waiting around for somebody to come along and finish that. We're not waiting around for somebody to come along and put finishing touches on Brother Bram's ministry. We don't need to go in and edit those sermons. Let me tell you, rapturing faith lays in that. Everything God wanted, uh, wanted him to say, I believe he said. And everything that God wanted us to have, I believe we have. And we're still printing it and sending it out all over the world. And uh, it still works. I believe the message is true. God knew exactly what he was doing. He didn't make any mistakes. And all the controversy hunters, you know, they're still out there hunting. But you know what? God's bride still moves right on. God's bride still presses on because, you know what? We believe, hey, we believe this is God's word. Now, let me tell you something. There was a brother who... Uh, uh, well, I'll just say this. He, I heard a minister, he was in uh, Jeffersonville uh, there, and, and he made a really profound statement uh, one time a little while ago, and I, I, I'll, just, I'll just leave this with you as we go on. 
But he, he said that, uh, you know, a lot of people, he said they, uh, they stop at that prophet. They stop at Brother Branham. And, and he said they, they really limit themselves when they do that. And he said, but I'll tell you what Brother Branham did for me. He said, Brother Branham led me to Christ. And once I got to Christ, he said, you know what? Everything was okay. He said, I could look back. When I, in Christ, looking through those glasses, he said, I could look back and see all of humankind and realize that, you know what? We're all capable of mistakes. We're all capable of doing and saying and feeling things wrong and interpreting things wrong. He said, you know what? And we're all human, and God made us that way. But he said, but what Brother Branham did, and the most significant thing that Brother Branham did was to bring me to Christ. And once I was in Christ, he said there was a security there and a permanence there and a peace there that you never get by following some man. And he said, I'm thankful for the ministry of Brother Branham for doing that. And I thought that was just a nice way of saying that. Now, it's really interesting. I don't know how we got here uh, in my church, but uh, there is a, a sister in our church who had some connection with the Chinese culture, and she was explaining to me and gave me a, a document about how the ch ancient Chinese people uh, made their words, and their words are obviously made of pictures and symbols that mean very little to us until you go to a Chinese restaurant, and they, they are very meaningful to Chinese people. And so she gave me an example of this, and I, I use this at home, that the word for lamb is the first symbol on, the, on your left. The, the word for me is this symbol over on the right. When you put two of these symbols together, you come up with another word that seemingly would be unrelated, righteousness. Now look at the construction of righteousness. The lamb is on the top, I'm on the bottom. So in other words, when God looks down at me, he sees the lamb first. In that position, I am righteous before him. Does that make sense? Hey, listen, that's only the example. Let me give you another one, and this is what I want to get to. <clears throat> that in our lives, we have opportunities to do things. And we have, uh, you know, there, there are lots of experiences that come our way. I found this interesting, that the word crisis is made up, again, of two symbols right here. And the first one is danger. That's the symbol on the top. And the bottom one is opportunity. So when you take danger and opportunity, it, 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 is, it is a crisis, but a crisis really affords us very often an opportunity to change. Isn't that right? Pain is a great teacher. And, and it is one of the best teachers, actually. And so when crises occur in our lives, and we should not begrudge, uh, you know, the, the path of life that brings us to a place of crisis, because very often those are the things that drive us to the cross. They drive us back to God. And there are crises that really are wake-up calls, and they are nothing but good for us in our lives. It's really interesting. We have a couple of neighbors in our, uh, live right next door to us, and they're a young couple, uh, real nice people, but they're not churchgoers at all, have no connection with the church. Every Sunday they're home. Uh, you know, they're just, they're just good, normal type people who uh, happen to live next door to us. And a couple of months ago, uh, the, the lady of the house, she was expecting, she was about 38 years old, somewhere around there, 40 years old, somewhere, uh, I would guess. And they already had one child, and she was expecting her second child, 28 weeks along. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, one day, she knew something happened, and that child died in her womb. And she was devastated. I mean, there was no, the doctors never gave her a reason as to why that happened, but, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it, it, was, it was final. And, uh, you know, she had to go through all of the processes when something like that happens. And uh, they, they, uh, they asked me, they, because we were helping them and we were, you know, kind of putting our arms around them and doing what we could and, and uh, trying to be comforting and supportive of them uh, because of what, they, what, you know, what a crush that was. And um, they asked me if I would speak at, at the funeral. They said, we want to give it a, a regular funeral and coffins this big. And, uh, you know, David, I, I took a, 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 quote, a section out of Psalms where David said, my life is as a hand breath. And a hand breath is this distance from, from the end of your thumb to the end of your pinky. And I said, that's probably the size of this little uh, child clover who had passed away. And I said, you know, David said that that's our life. That's, 
he said, in terms of the comparison with eternity, he said that's kind of how, how long it, uh, it, it really is. And I had the chance to be able to go to the graveside, and it was just the three of us there. And uh, they, they sat in chairs, and I pulled up a chair and sat down and talked to them about, uh, you know, life and how God is the author of life, and there's things that we don't always understand and all the things that were said. And they were, they were really uh, comforted by that, they told me. And, and uh, you know, they were, they were happy with that. And, you know, sometimes you don't realize the impression that you're making on people. And then today, I was preparing for service, and I had a, uh, a text from uh, him the husband, and he said, are you home? And I said, no, I'm not home. I'm, in, I'm at Brother Paul's. Oh, you know, and everybody knows where Brother Paul's is. And uh, <clears throat> he, said, he said, well, I don't want to interrupt your vacation. <laughs> I said back, when you come to Brother Paul's, you're never really on vacation. You're always working. And I said, uh, I said what, what's happening? And he said, well, he said, I just had a situation happen at work, and he said, I'll probably lose my job. And uh, he said, we're really concerned about it. And, you know, it, it's kind of been a year of bad news for them. And he, he said, now these are people that don't believe in God at all. And he said, I just wanted to ask you if it would be all right. He said, if you would pray for me. And all, all I'm saying to you is this, is that, you know, a crisis happens. And sometimes we think, oh, it's just a bad day or I'm having bad luck or something else. That really can be an opportunity for something really good to happen. So you're better off not shaking your fist at God, but rather just to, to realize that there's probably something I can learn through the crises that happen in my life. And we should not turn our back, from, uh, turn our back on them. Now, <clears throat> Peter says, and I, I just want to give you some principles here tonight, and, and we'll, we'll move into an area that I've never spoken about before. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter says, and this is all familiar to you, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slowness. And that's what that Greek word means there, uh, that people would say, well, God is slow doing things. You know what I mean? Uh, Brother Branham talked about 1977, and then every 2,000 years something happened. Well, you know, God's kind of slow. Well, you should not count God slow, because that's not the way that God operates. But he's long-suffering to us word. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And this idea that, uh, you know, without understanding, if you're looking at, uh, sometimes you're looking at the timeline of God, it's not always clear exactly what God's doing. And it can appear like God is doing nothing during certain seasons. And I want to tell you here tonight, I don't believe that that's true. I don't believe there's ever a time when God's doing nothing. God is always doing something in our lives. God's always doing something in the world. Now, in the church age book, hold on to that thought. Brother Branham says, now, we come to the last age in the Laodicean age. He said, this is our age, and we know it is the last age of the, uh, because the Jews are back in Palestine, and this is harvest time. And he said, but before there can be a harvest, there has to be a ripening, a maturing of everything, both the vines, right? It's got to come, and this is what that word means there, it's got to come to full development. If you look up the word uh, ripening, it means that it's got to come to full development. Now, I was using this illustration. I'm not going to use it tonight the way I did in my own church. But, uh, for instance, uh, how many of you young people are here tonight that are not 25 years old yet but have your driver's license? Huh. Let me, I got a little bit of news for you. You may not appreciate this, but I got, I got to tell you this, that nobody really wants you to drive. There ain't nobody who wants you to drive. I'll guarantee you that your mothers don't want you to drive because they worry every time you pull out of the driveway. Even if they don't say anything, they're worried anyway because that's what mothers do. I will tell you something else, that your pastor doesn't want you to drive and be rolling around that parking lot out there. The state troopers don't want you to drive. Uh, The judges in this community don't want you to drive. Uh, They know. They know something about you before you turn 25 and that is that your brain is not fully developed. Insurance companies will change the rate of your insurance when you turn 25 if you're single. Now, they'll change it earlier if you get married because the insurance companies will turn it over to your wife to get your brain to grow up. <laughs> but if, if you're single, your insurance rate stays high until you're 25. Not because you're stupid, but because you haven't come to full development yet. So you figure that, hey, it's all right if I go backwards on the interstate, or it's okay if I drive at 80 miles an hour and use the phone. Oh, somebody's texting me at the same time. 
there's a, a lack of full development. It's not, it's not that there's no development, it's just that it's not full development yet. So we gotta wait until that happens, all right? We gotta wait until this, this whole process is complete. And that's the idea that we're trying to convey tonight. That before there can be a harvest, there has to be a completion of the process. There has to be a, a full execution of the, of the whole uh, maturing process here of both of these vines. That's what Brother Bram's telling us, all right? Now, we find that in Show Us the Father, Brother Bram said, now Jesus said the word was uh, a seed and the seed that the sower sowed. Now, he says, now you people out here in Oregon, you don't have to go out every morning and dig up the plant. He says, you plant a crop of corn every morning to go out and dig it up and look at it and say, what's in that? I don't see a thing going on. It'll never grow if you do that. You have to commit it to the ground. You have to commit it and let it grow. He says, don't dig it up. You've got to commit it to the ground. That's the place for it. And every time you dig it up, you delay it. When you get involved in that process, you can delay the whole thing. So therefore, the nature itself tells you that there are seasons where something is physically happening or you're involved in doing something, but then there are seasons where the work, in a sense, is not always visible, but it's still going on. It's getting you to where you need to be, right? And you may not even be fully aware of that. You might, you might react to that kind of differently, but in God's plan, God is always in the process of getting you somewhere, He's always bringing you to something, and that something is something better, something higher, something more, uh, more profound and more perfect. God is doing that, and he's moving the bride towards the kingdom. How many would agree? He's moving things back uh, to the way that they should be. And, and so this is the principle that Brother Branham is telling us about here, that uh, you, you, you can actually get involved in this process and delay it if you're not careful. Now, let me give you an example here. You remember when Brother Branham uh, prophesied and said, I'm going to have a son. And he said that son's name is going to be Joseph. Remember that, that story? And then uh, here's Brother Branham in 1955, and he's in his own church, and he's saying this to the people. Some, something said, uh, you're going to have a boy, and you'll call his name Joseph. And about a month after that, we found out uh, we were pregnant, and this was Sarah Branham who came. And uh, Brother Branham said it was a Josephine. Well, immediately, immediately, as he says here, uh, some people said, so many thought that I said that that was Joseph. And I said, no, no, I didn't say that was Joseph. Some said, didn't you see a, a vision of this? He said, you know how people get things mixed up. And I said, I got tapes on it. Listen, now he's telling this to his own church. Sounds like he's on the defensive here. And he said, I never said it was Joseph. The Lord put it on my heart that I'm going to have a son by the name of Joseph. I don't know how, I don't know when, but there's obviously a space of time here. Now, God gave us a daughter, and we're thankful for the daughter, but uh, let me tell you what was going on behind the scenes here that you may not know. There was a fellow who was in the church at that time, in Branham Tabernacle, who made it a point to get on the phone and call everybody in the church and say, Brother Branham said that was going to be a boy. Brother Branham told us that was going to be a boy. And caused that unrest among the people there, and that's why he had to get up several times and say things like this, because he said, you want to listen to it? Go back on the tapes, find out what I said. He said, I'm going to have a son. And this was because that there was a person in there. And here's what I want you to understand. I want you to get a hold of this. That in the season where there's a delay, the enemy goes right to work. Whenever there's a delay and it looks like something is not happening here or, you know, it's not visible at least, the enemy jumps right in and causes upset right in the middle of that delay. He always does. And we can take a lot of time and look in different scriptures here. Here's one, Luke chapter 8. This is a story where Jesus is on one side over in Israel, and it says that they get into the ship with his disciples, and he went over and they launched the boat, and as they sailed, he fell asleep. And what Brother Branham told us here is that he's actually resting between revivals. Because he gets over on the other side to Gadara, and uh, there's a great miracle that takes place over there, Right? A great, great thing that happens over there. And if you look at the previous parts of Luke chapter 8, all the miracles take place over on this side. And then he leaves that revival, gets in the boat, goes over on the other side. But he takes a rest during that time. Here, Brother Bam said he was resting between revivals. Well, you know what happens during the delay? The enemy comes right in and causes a storm, right? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. I will tell you that whenever you get into a space like that, the enemy comes in and tries to cause some sort of an upset that nobody's expecting, but all of a sudden he's right there. Are we okay? 
<clears throat> awakening Jesus. I'm going somewhere with this. And he said, and these disciples were doing the same thing. They were rejoicing and living on what they had done probably the day before, the week before, the year before. And they were testifying about it and giving a testimony of it. And he says, and how do we know that as Jesus in, the, in their day was resting between revivals? How do we know maybe he's resting now between the revivals? Now, understand, it doesn't mean that there's nothing happening. But I will tell you, it's a season or an opportunity for the enemy to come in and cause upset. Because we're here, and it seems like, you know, you may be sitting there thinking, well, God's, God's certainly pretty slow at getting the bride all together. And, uh, you know, it's Wednesday night again. Here we are in 2022. Who knew we'd be here in 2022, right? We're still having to deal with it and still having to, I mean, you know, goodness, you wonder how long we're going to be here. And, uh, you know, people are, uh, everyone's praying that we get out of here, except for the young people who are not married yet. They kind of want to hang on just a little bit longer, just a shade longer, right? But for the rest of us, we're all ready to go. And when you get into that season of delay, let me tell you something. The enemy moves right in very quickly and moves in very subtly. You remember Esther, right? You remember Esther, and, you know, she's, she's in there and, uh, you know, preparing meals for the king and all the rest of it. Well, while all of that's going on there and this law's been passed, nothing's happening at the moment here, but Haman comes in and he's trying to cause a stir. But now let's just go a little bit further here because I want to deal with this little part here. You know the story of Esther and you've, you've been taught that. Uh, regularly. But this is the, the scripture, the, the beginning of the story here in chapter 2. And it says that the maiden, Esther, pleased him and she obtained kindness of him. And he speedily gave her things for purification. So this is the, the, the head honcho who was preparing these women for uh, possible marriage to the king, right? You know the story. And he, she finds favor with him and he's giving her everything that she needs and uh, she's given seven maidens, and they were meet to be given to her out of the king's house. And he preferred her and her maids unto the best place of the house of the women. Now, <clears throat> what's interesting is that uh, it says that uh, Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred. She never uh, revealed her genealogy, that she was a Jew. For Mordecai had charged her that she should not do it. And every day, every day, Mordecai walked, uh, every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. Now, I want to tell you that this is not an overnight process. Every day he walks past the palace and he's trying to look in. He's got his phone ready in case he sees her and he's going to snap a picture of her and send it back to the folks. And you know, every day he's just kind of looking to see. And you know how long he does that? He does that for over a year. Because that's how long it took for them to go through the process of purification. I want you to think about this now. Nothing happens here. Esther's, she's bathing, she's preparing, she's going through the rituals that they have here, and she's got seven maidens to help her out. But this is a long process before she actually gets to go in and see the king. Nothing's going on here. Let's finish the verses here. And now, when every maid's turn was come to go into King Ahasuerus, after she had been 12 months according to the manner of women. Look at that. After she had been 12 months, according to the manner of women, for so were the days of purification accomplished, to wit, six months with oil of myrrh, six months, sweet odors, and so forth. This is the way that the women were purified. I wondered about why it took so long, because, I mean, she's going through this process here, and to us, it just looks like a bunch of perfume. I mean, that's a lot of stuff, right? That's a lot of myrrh, and a lot of sweet odors, and everything else. And when I went back and saw that, that verse 12 again, she had been there 12 months according to the manner of women. I will tell you something, that if a woman waits 12 months before going into the king, we can be certain as to whether she's received the seed of another man. After the manner of women. So we know that if she becomes expecting it's got to be the king now because she's sat there for 12 months in the delay and nothing's happened. If she had 
received seed from another man, guess what? It's going to show up within 12 months. No fooling this process. So God uses the delay to manifest things. God uses the delay for his own purpose to bring out things that activity does not bring out. Does that make sense? Wow. I was so happy when I saw that because I will tell you something. You may sit there again. You may sit there and think, well, until tonight, that, you know, not much has happened, you know, not much is going on and so forth. I will tell you this, that God, God has a purpose in all of it, and God will let things go on to manifest what's in the heart of every believer in this world today. To find out whether you're going to stay true to the word or whether you're going to run after this or run after that or whether you've actually received the seed of another teaching or another movement. Hello? Because you know what? Give it a couple of years, we're going to find out where everybody stands. But you know what? With the bride, at the end of the delay, it doesn't matter how long. At the end of the delay, the bride is still standing there saying, I'm so glad I can say I'm one of them. And they believe the word. They're just waiting for, the, uh, for that, uh, you know, taking away of the bride. They talk about the rapture. They talk about the change of the body. And you know what? Things come, things go. Things come, things go. And they've got one thing on their mind. I've got to stay with the word. I've got to stay with the word. I've got to stay with the word. I've got to stay pure. I've got to stay purified. I've got to go through this process. Doesn't matter how long. Delay doesn't bother me. Because if I'm a child of God, it's only going to manifest more of the character of Christ in me. They're not afraid of delay. They're not worried about delay. Matter of fact, you know, bring it on. That's their attitude. Bring it on. Delay is a good thing. If you're pure, delay is a good thing. Because if you've received the seed of somebody else, it's going to manifest itself. And sometimes it doesn't take 12 months. Let me give you an example here. Exodus chapter 32. Remember where Moses is? He's on top of the mountain. And God is writing out commandments on the stones. And when Moses comes down, God says, you better get down because I'll blow the whole thing wide open. Moses goes down and he said, what did this people do to you? That thou hast brought so great a sin upon them. You know the story. They had made a, a golden calf, right? Because you know what? You can take the boy out of Egypt, but you can't always take Egypt out of the boy. I said you can take the boy out of Egypt, but you can't always take Egypt out of the boy. And they still had the seeds of their former way of worship in them and they went right back to it in the delay. Because they said, you know what? Moses is not coming back. My goodness, he's been up there that long. And they said, uh, you know, I mean, he's probably never coming back. So, you know, they're in the delay and they're kind of thinking, well, my goodness, what's happening? There's really nothing happening. And Aaron, we ought to make something happen here. And they put, their, put all their metal together and they made themselves a golden calf. And Aaron says, hey, it wasn't me, it was the people. People forced me to do it. And Moses stood in the gate of the camp and he said, who's on the Lord's side? Come unto me. The delay manifests everything. Can I go a little further? Now, <clears throat> what's really interesting, what's really interesting here <clears throat> is that there are all kinds of things about the message that we really still haven't seen. There's, we know that God is the author of Revelation, isn't he? And he's the one that knows how to reveal things in season. And we, hey, listen, it's just like the Bible. We've, we've had the Bible since Martin Luther's time. And the Bible's everywhere. There's, there's all kinds of versions of the Bible. Bibles are everywhere. I mean, you can't check into a hotel room, but there's one in your room there, right? I mean, Bibles are everywhere. But I will say this, and I'll be willing to say this for most of you, that you never really understood what was in the Bible until God opened your eyes to what was in there. You always had it, but you never really saw it like you see it now. And it's no different with the message. God is the author of Revelation, and Jesus even thanked God. He said, I thank God that these things are hidden from the wise and prudent, but revealed unto babes such as would learn. And you know what? We're still learning things about the message. We're still learning things about the Bible. Isn't that right? We probably didn't know that about Esther, Queen Esther there. And you know, I mean, it's just that. And, and don't give me don't give credit for that. Hey, that's him. And uh, it, it's kind of like, you know, the... But let, let, me, let me say it this way. It's important for ministers to surrender and submit to God so that he can give us things for you 
But really, at the end of the day, it's His grace that He wants to bring things to you to help you, right? <clears throat> and I, I, I realize my position. I'm a carrier, not a source. But you know what? When that woman in the days of Jesus, when she knelt before Jesus in Simon's house, remember, and poured the oil over his feet and washed and, and rubbed his feet and took her hair and rubbed his feet. You know what? She was, a, she was a carrier. She was doing something. And Jesus even said, we want you to remember this. Wherever the gospels preach, we want you to remember what this woman did. But when she left the house, she smelled just like Jesus did. Because what she gave out, some of it got on her as well. It's in her hair. It's on her hands. And, you know, she, he, she's carrying a little bit of that because she was obedient to what God told her to do. And even if you're a carrier, there's some of that stuff that gets on you. And I'll tell you what, I, I'm thankful for that. I, I'm, I'm thankful for the blessing of being able to minister to God's people. But I, I'll say this, that, you know, when revelation comes, it comes because God's opened your eyes and God, there's a season where God's revealed things to you. And I was talking about this and somebody said to me, well, it's just like the arrow on the FedEx logo. Really? There's an arrow in the FedEx logo? Do you know there's an arrow in the FedEx logo? Or are you just saying that? You're just saying that because... Okay, all right, he knows. And then one day I got a... I got a shot of the, <clears throat> I got a shot of this logo, huh. and I realized there's an arrow in there, and they made that logo with that arrow pointing right, because that's the right way to ship something, that's why they put that arrow there, you everybody see the arrow, let's be honest, how many of you, you don't need to show your hands, but how many of you never knew there was an arrow in there before, but you know what, how, how many times have you seen the FedEx truck roll up to your house and rolling down the street? We've looked at it all the time. But it takes somebody who's, who, who knows it's there to point that out to you, even though you've had it with you all, all the years that you've lived in North America. Hey, that's really not any different than how God deals with us. Because there are things that are laying in the Word of God that are mysteries that God, any season, He reveals those things to us. And it's not because we are worthy, but because God loves you and God places a ministry to be able to bring those things out. And we all have a role and a purpose in doing that. And there are, there are things that we see. And I'll guarantee you that whenever you go down the road now and you look and see the FedEx truck, that's all you're going to see is the arrow. Every time you see one, you're going to be looking at that and realizing, wow, that's, that's there. It really is there. All right, now let's be specific for a few minutes here. That's all right. I think I mentioned this to you before when I was here last. And by the way, now we're two to nothing. Just saying. Job is a book that's unusual. To me, it's unusual. I don't mean that disrespectfully, but there are things about the book of Job that I don't fully understand. And it's the oldest book, and there's lots of great truths that are in there. And this was one that puzzled me for a long time. And forgive me if I've said this to you before, but just to refresh your memory. And I just want you to take note of how God deals with us. Because remember now, as I said to you already, that it is, it is God who's going to perform the work. It, it's God who's going to bring it to completion. Isn't that right? Even when you feel like quitting, and even when you feel like giving up. And I want to say this to you, that... Just because you're a believer doesn't mean that you always automatically have to feel right, do right, and be right. It's okay to not feel okay. I said it's okay not to feel okay. Because there are lots of things going on around us that can be discouraging and can cause you to be anxious and cause you to wonder about things. And you know what? You're human. And you're going to have to blame God for that. He made you that way. But I will tell you that, you know, there are things happen, there are things that you counted on that didn't turn out the way you thought, dreams you had that didn't come to pass, ministers that didn't really, didn't really, they didn't really get it. And church situations and health situations, marriage situations, children situations, all of us are subject to those things. And there are things that happen to us that you know, in, in, in reality, there's, there's times when, if we're honest and we showed our show of hands, many of us would probably feel like turning back and just saying, hey, I'm just going to sit by the sidelines until, 
I can make sense out of this and just back away for a little while. And I'm not saying that that's a good thing for all of us to feel, but in reality, we probably all do at different times. But I want you to know this, that your eternal destiny was never put in your hands. The way for you to get from here to there was never given to you. He said, I'll be with you and I'll be in you and I'll, I'll, I'll bring you to my house. I've got a place prepared for you and I, I'm going to come and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. And, and, he, and he said that I, I know how to get you there. I know the way to my own house and I'll get you there. So let me tell you, he, he, never, he never gave us, in my, and I've looked at my job description a lot of times as a Christian, a minister, and I've never found down there where God said, you need to find that place. You need to get there. He doesn't say that. He says you need to submit. You need to obey. You need to open your heart and mind and let me guide you and let me be that continual presence in your life and let me let you get, get there. I remember one time Brother Charlie Cox, he had a conversation with Brother Branham and, and uh, you know, he, as a young Christian, he always wanted to have the experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That was a big thing for him. He really wanted to have that. And he said he would get out by himself in the field and he'd pray and he'd go in the woods and he said, I'd have these times where he said, it was like all the angels were around me and they surrounded me. And he said, I felt that presence. And there was other times I didn't feel anything. And he said, there was times when I was in church and it was like God was right there sitting next to me. And he said, I just wanted to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He yearned for that. Finally, Brother Branham one day comes up to him and he says, hey, Brother Charlie, he says, I understand you've been seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He never told Brother Branham that, but he said, I understand you've been seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he said, yes, I have. And he said, well, let me tell you something. He said, next time you feel that presence like you have in the past, he says, just give in to it. Just surrender to it. That's all you need to do. I thought, wow, what a great answer. Because a lot of times we have a preconceived idea about what something's got to be. We have a preconceived idea about what God's got to do. God does not have to do anything that we think he's got to do. God is sovereign, and he does what he wants, right? We can make a lot of assumptions about things, and we can be flat wrong. Hmm. But we can be sincere, but we can be flat wrong. But you know what? You're still wrong. It's kind of like the fellow who every day, he was a plant foreman, and in this little town in England, and every day he went past uh, the watchmaker's shop in the morning. First thing in the morning, he'd walk past the watchmaker's shop, pull out his stopwatch, and he'd look at the clocks in the window, and he would set his clock, make sure it was exactly matched with this, because he thought, my goodness, everyone, if anyone in town is going to have the right time, it's going to be the watchmaker, right? Duh. So he sets his clock every day when he goes past the watchmaker, sets that, and he was the guy who blew the horn every day at the factory at noon. So right at noon, he would blow that, that horn. And you know what happened at noon every day? The watchmaker got in the window Fixed all of his clocks to noon because he figured that, that horn's not going to be wrong. If you didn't get that, I'll see you after church, all right? We can make assumptions about things that, that nobody sees. Now remember now, God's dedicated to you, right? Because he said, and this is what Paul told the Philippians, that he that has begun a good work in you, he'll complete that work, right? So God's not quitting somewhere in the middle. God is not leaving you because you mess up so often. Thank God for that. But I want you to notice, just, just as an example here, in the days of Job, his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and drink with them. I mean, they were having a great time. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. So there was a bunch of sons. There was at least three daughters. So he counted out the offerings every day, probably so many turtle doves or whatever else. And he made those offerings, probably seven or eight, and made those every day made sure everybody had an offering made for them. And he offered burnt offerings according to the number of them, of them all. For Job said, this is what he's thinking, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This thus did Job continually. Now we have no evidence at all that his sons sinned. 
But Job is offering an offering early, every day, for every one of them. It says continually, for how long we don't know. And I began to wonder about that verse, and I was looking at it and looking at the Hebrew, because I have some help, helps that help me understand what the actual language of the biblical Hebrew is. And what I found out was something that you'd be able to relate to when I tell you, and that is this thing called a spirit of entitlement. We don't know that these guys sinned, but Job was afraid that his children would have a spirit of entitlement that would make them say something like this. Hey, you know what? Our dad's Job. <laughs> and you know what? Our house has been blessed for a long time. God's done a lot of great things for us. And we are essentially, I mean, we live with the most righteous man on the earth. We've done pretty good. In terms of the message of the hour, we're kind of on the upper half. Matter of fact, we're pretty close to the top because we're Job's sons. And you know what? God's got to bless me because I'm Job's son. God's got to, God's got to do things for me. And you know what? I can, I can make the edges of the law a little soft here and a little soft there. You know why? Because my dad is Job. My dad's a prophet. My dad's got communion with God. And we know that God visits my dad. And he's got revelations. And he's got... He's got a communion with a walk with God. So you know what it says? They're having a great time. They're living, they're living the, the message dream. They're going everywhere to camps, and they're looking at all the girls, and the girls are looking at the boys. And You know what? We don't need to get too serious with God because, you know, after all, my dad's a prophet, so, you know, if it ever need, we ever need to get serious, we can always go to dad. God's got to bless us because we're, you know, for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. And my dad's brother Paul, so, you know, sure, should I not have said that? <coughs> my dad's brother Barry, so, you know what? I've kind of got a seniority slash immunity slash protection slash a little bit of a lax code for my sons because they're brother Barry's sons. And you know what that is? That's a spirit of entitlement. And Job is afraid they may have that, and that's why he's offering offerings just in case. It doesn't say they've sinned, but just in case they develop an attitude. You know why? Because your attitude speaks just as loud as your words. And your attitude and your, your inner thoughts, they speak often loud or louder than anything you may say or do. Are you with me? Job's not offering offerings for their sins. He's offering offerings in case. Because he knows how God operates. He knows how God's laws work. He knows that God is a respecter of nobody. In the delay, everything is manifested. I'm just saying. <clears throat> Can I take this one step further? Now, if you have your Bible, I'd like you to go to a place over here in the book of 2 Samuel. <coughs> 2 Samuel, if you have a Bible. If you have a phone, you can dial it. I think I have the first couple of verses here on the screen, but if you don't mind, well, the screen went away. <coughs> Now, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, it starts out and says that this was the season of the battle of the kings. In other words, kings were supposed to be out on the battlefield during this season. And this is the story of the chapter that deals with David taking Bathsheba. Just a few minutes longer, okay, if you'll just give me a couple more minutes here. David is supposed to be on that battleground because he's trained to battle that way. That's what David's done all his life. He's been trained that way. But he exempts himself. God does not tell him to avoid the battle. He exempts himself. And guess what? Now he's faced with a battle he's not prepared for. Now he's got a battle of the mind. He's got a temptation here, and he's not trained to deal with this. 
He's supposed to be somewhere else because he's trained for that. And I would just say this to you, that sometimes when God tells you to do something and you say, well, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this over here. You can wind up in a battlefield that you're not prepared for at all. And you'll run into enemies and you'll run into problems over here that you never counted on because you're not trained for that. But if you're in the place where God wants you to be, and whether it's a housewife, whether it's a wife, whether it's a student or whether it's a minister or whatever it is, God's trained you. And Brother Branham talked to those full gospel businessmen. You remember that? And they were, they were successful in business, so they figured, ah, you know what? I can go over here and be a minister. And they were moving into an area of battle that they were not trained for at all. And they preached prosperity and they preached all these other things that had no relation to the gospel at all. So then we know the story how David falls in that temptation and then he's got all of his bases covered except one. That's the vertical one. You understand what I'm saying? You rise dead, buried. Everybody's kind of gone their own way because the battle's over. They're all gone back home. And David is sitting on the throne. Bathsheba is over here just having delivered a child. And David thinks, you know what? God hasn't said a thing to me, so this is okay. And all of a sudden, Nathan shows up. And when Nathan comes to David, he tells him this story. And the story down to verse 6 here is kind of heartbreaking, really. You know, it gives you the... Doesn't it? There were two men in a city. One was rich, the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing. Save one little lamb which he had bought and nourished up. And it grew up together with him and his children and did eat of his meat and drink of his own cup, lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a man, rich man. He speared to take of his own flock and of his own herd. And you know what he did? He took that little lamb from that man and he dressed it for the wayfaring man that was coming to his house. And he took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for that man that was come to him. Well, you know, I want to say this, that David is capable of seeing the hurt that someone else did, but didn't see the hurt that he had caused himself. He's capable of judging this correctly because he sees what someone else has done. He doesn't know that this is not true. He's giving a true judgment here based on the law of what this should happen in a case like this. He's capable of feeling compassion for this man and the loss of that little lamb who was like a daughter to him. But he can't see what he just did and feel the same way. He can't feel what he's just done to Uriah and Uriah's family, and what he's just committed, and all of the associated hurt that goes with that. And he's not repenting. He's not lamenting that. He's not going to God. He's not spending time after church in the sanctuary by himself. He's not seeking God here. He's pretending it didn't happen. What is it that's going on in David that he's willing, listen, that he's willing to risk it all for an affair when he has lived through everything God has done for him to get him to, to that throne. He's lived through it. He knew what it was like to act like a crazy man in front of the Philistines. He knew what it was like to be chased by King Saul. He knew what it was like to feel the conviction of God. He knew what it was like, uh, you know, to be out there in front of Goliath and trusting God with just a stone in his hand. He knew what it was like to depend on God in the fields to kill the bear and the lion. He knew what it was like to have to deal with the wrath of King Saul who threw a javelin at him. He knew what it was like, how many times God had spared his life. He knew his origin. He knew where he came from. What is it in David that's willing to risk it all for this affair with Bathsheba? Now, that's a good question. Because this is not just 
This is not just a sin. This is a betrayal of a covenant. He's a married man. And he has, he has committed this relationship betrayal. Now look, folks, historically, if somebody betray, betrayed their relationship, they generally had a child out of wedlock. Everybody knew that they had betrayed their marriage vows, right? But isn't it true today that the lines have gotten a lot softer? Because now, what is a betrayal now? Is pornography a betrayal? Is dating apps on your phone if you're a married man or woman, is that a betrayal? Is flirting with somebody a betrayal? Should I not have said this? Is looking up your old flames on Facebook, is that a kind of betrayal? The boundaries are blurred. But I will tell you what, in every case, an affair is organized around a secret. It's always organized around a secret. Because you can't bring it out in the open. And this energy that a person has, like David, this energy for the thing that is forbidden, I will tell you something, is as powerful as the real thing. And it drives people to commit things that are outside of their boundaries because all of a sudden they're feeling something that they haven't felt in a while. Now let me tell you something. And I want you to remember this. That when an attraction happens like this, it's not necessarily because you want to leave your spouse, but because you want to leave the person you are becoming. You're really wanting more to leave the person you're becoming than to leave your spouse. And when David, listen now, <clears throat> when, when Nathan goes to David, he's telling David something very personal. He's, he's giving him this example right here. And he says, David, look where you've come to. You've come to the place where you can't feel compassion over what you're doing, but you can feel compassion for someone else. Think about this. And God says to him, right in the next verse, verse 5, if you have it open here, in the next verse, David, or, or sorry, David's anger, sorry, I'm, I'm in the, the wrong chapter here. Verse 6, or I'm sorry, verse 7. The parable's over, and Nathan says to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee to the, in thy master's house wives and so forth. He says, Wherefore, verse 9, Thou hast despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight. And not only that, but he said, you brought reproach against the kingdom of God so that his enemies would be able to blaspheme the kingdom. God's not even able to hold his kings with all the blessings that he's bestowed upon them. Now, therefore, he says in verse 10, the sword shall never leave thy house. And thus saith the Lord, I will raise up evil against thee in thine own house. And David, in verse 12, he says to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. This was different now than King Saul, but David now, when he's confronted with the reality of what he's done and how far he's gone, not overnight, but he's gone to this place where he's willing to risk everything that God has done for him and everything that God's given to him, everything that God's bestowed upon him, he's willing to risk that because he wants to leave the person he has become and he's become that in a season where he doesn't have the fight and the pressure. In a sense, it's kind of like a delay season. And the delay manifests everything. Wow. If a man after God's own heart can come to the place where he can lose the feeling for somebody and not acknowledge it and not recognize it, 
and the hurt he's caused and the reproach he's brought to the kingdom. And he's sitting on the throne like he, nothing's happened and nothing's gone wrong. And Nathan has to come and bring that to him. And here is David. Let me tell you, sometimes a person who's in this place, like David, they're looking at themselves and they're looking at their spouse and they're saying, you know what, there's got to be something wrong with this relationship and there's probably something wrong with you and they're willing to put the blame on everybody else and they're moving away from the boundaries that they never thought they would cross because they're really want, wanting, they're really wanting to escape who they are becoming. All I'm saying is that I'm glad for Philippians 1 and 6, where God says, through Paul, you need to be confident of this one thing, that he who hath begun a good work in you will complete it. Because in your darkest days, in your times of temptation, in your times when things get rough and tight, and, and it seems like nobody cares, and you're not feeling what you should be feeling, and you've got other thoughts, and you've got your head, you're up to your eyeballs in temptation, let me tell you, God is not going to let you go halfway through the process. He's going to execute this. He's going to bring it right to the end. And God knows exactly how to pull the rug out. He's going to turn your world upside down. He's going to do whatever it takes. He's going to do what he needs to do. He's going to make you aware of things because you know what? He's not way off there in the fog. He's now in us and will be in us and with us until the very end. That's why Paul's encouraging the Philippians and saying he has begun a good work. He is going to see it through all the way to the end. Aren't you glad you got that kind of a Holy Spirit? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if that was true in the early church, it's still true today. And it doesn't matter, saints of God, it doesn't matter how long this thing goes. I'm glad with Christ in me, we'll be able to rise over every wave and every situation and every circumstance because we're not trusting in Brother Barry and we're not trusting in Brother Paul and we're certainly not trusting in you or you or you. Let me tell you, we're trusting in him to see it through to the very end of the way. Let's stand to our feet. God is good to us. I'm thankful if our musicians will come. I'm thankful that we have a God who shows mercy. And even, even in the middle of David, David's trouble, uh, you know, Nathan tells him, he says, listen, he says, you've done this and God saw it all because you're able to cover up everything except the vertical, but God has spared you. There's going to be troubles in your house. There's going to be a sword in your house for the rest of your days, but you know what? God has spared you. He's going to save your life. He's going to take that baby, but he's going to save your life. Because God knew he could deal with David. God knew David had the kind of a heart that he could deal with, and he could confront David. He could bring truth to David, and David would respond to that. I pray God would give all of us that kind of a heart. That whenever we're confronted with truth, and sometimes, you know, a minister will get right in your face and preach the thing that you need to hear. May God always give us a heart that's not hardened by circumstances or our own neglect, but rather we'll, we'll respond to that and say, Lord, have mercy upon me. Lord, do whatever it takes. Move me where I need to be moved. Bring people into my life that need to be brought into my life. Change the circumstances. But Lord, may I never bring a reproach against this message. May I never bring a reproach against you. May I stand for truth all the days of my life. Let's sing that little chorus, Brother Kenny, that we, we, we ended with, We Are Your House. Let's sing that this evening here. I'll turn it to Brother Paul here. Sorry to keep you so long. We are his house. We are his people. Be encouraged, saints of God. He's watching over you because if he chose you, he's, gonna, he's got a plan. He's got all the details worked out to get you to the very end. And he sees you just as much in the wedding supper as he sees you tonight. He sees you in glory as much as he sees the mistake you made today. He sees you in a new body as much as he saw uh, the things you said to your, your uh, significant other people in your life. He saw all of He sees all of our mistakes. He knows all those weaknesses that we have. Let me tell you, we are his. The best thing you can say is that we are his. And Lord, no matter how long this thing goes on, no matter how long we wait upon this earth, Lord, give me a, give me a faithfulness. Give me a faithfulness that you're proud of. Give me a Give me a perseverance like Brother Brandon preached about. We are your house. Sing it now, tonight. Oh, we are your house. Father, come and dwell. 
Yes, we are your house, a holy house a prayer, where the lost and the lonely bring their burdens and their care. We are your house. Yes, we are your house. Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence tonight, thanking you for your love and your mercy and your patience with us. We are not a people, Lord, who are exempt from temptations and trials. We all make mistakes, Lord. Father, we're thankful for he that is in us, because he that is in us is greater than he that's in the world. And Lord, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And Lord, even when we make the mistakes we do, Lord, we can come back quickly and repent of those things and make them right. Lord, look at my desire. Look at my heart. Lord, don't always look at my actions, but look at my heart my desire. We want to live for you. We want to live in a pure and righteous way. Father, speak to us, I pray, through your word. Encourage every heart, Lord. We thank you for this time together. Give it all to you now in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Bring healing to those who are needed. Lord, there's many people, Lord, who need a healing touch tonight. We commend them into your care, Lord. You're a God who understands. You're a God who knows what we go through. Help us, Lord, I pray in Jesus' lovely name. Amen.